Welcome, everybody, to the November 20th, 2017, regularly scheduled Midland Public Schools Board of Education meeting. At this time, if everyone would please turn off their cell phones, otherwise it interferes with our television feed. And if everyone would stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Scott, if you would please take roll. Of course. President Branstad. Here. Vice President Singer. Here. Treasurer Frazee. Here. Member Baker. Here. Member Blazy. Here. Member Fidel. Here. All right. Present. Everyone is here tonight. Welcome, everybody. All right. Moving into item two, which is our consent agenda. 2.1 is approval of the regular meeting minutes from our October 16th, 2017 meeting. 2.2 is the following persons who are recommended for employment for this school year. 2.3 are the following staff members who are announced their resignations with the effective dates noted. 2.4 is approval of the payment of the school system's bills for the month of September as listed. And 2.5 are legal invoices for payment. This time I'll entertain a motion. I move to approve items 2.1 through 2.5 on the consent agenda. Support. Moved by Pam, support by Scott. Is there any discussion? All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? All right, the consent agenda passes. Moving into item three, which is Board of Education Matters, presentations to the board. We'll do the shining stars. And our first shining star is Julie Volano. Julie would come up, I don't really see Julie. There she is, hiding back there. Come on, you gotta stand next to me, Julie. Don't be shy. <laughs> I love this. Let me read a little bit about, little bit about Julie here. Uh, Julie began her employment with Midland Public Schools in 1995 as a third grade classroom teacher at Plymouth Elementary School. In 1997, she began teaching at Jefferson Middle School. During her almost 20 years at Jefferson, she also served as an assistant softball coach, co-activities director, tennis coach, intramural advisor, and teacher leader. <laughs> In 2015, Julie provided administrative support following a vacancy to the Jefferson Assistant Principal's promotion. In 2016, Julie joined H.H. Dow High Charger staff as an assistant principal. The position she continues to hold today. Julie has bachelor's degrees and a master's degree from Saginaw Valley State University. Julie was nominated for a shining star by an educational colleague from a partner organization. Among their comments were the following. Julie has been overwhelmingly accepting and helpful in transitioning my students to Dow High. She has been a source of resolution when conflicts arise. She has offered many times to assist when it becomes necessary. Students with moderate to severe autism come with some very challenging barriers <coughs> to learning and being with their peers, but she has always been tolerant and seeks out opportunities to say hello to the entire classroom. Her kindness is often remarked upon by staff. She does not, she does not reserve it for MPS students only. She's an example of how administrators can make a school feel more welcoming and inclusive. Congratulations, Joey. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thank you, Julie. Thank you so much. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. We have two more shining stars because um, we have like a co one. And hopefully I don't murder their names. I have keys here, so hopefully I don't do this wrong. Uh, first one is Heather Hoppenjohn. If Heather would come up. Did I do it right, Heather? And the second one is Sally Matula. If Sally would come up as well. Ouch. <laughs> Hi. And they have a partner with her, and that's partly why they are here this evening. Um, let me read a little bit about them and what has occurred. Um, first, Heather. Heather began her employment with MPS in 2015 as a paraprofessional at Chestnut Hill Elementary, where she supports special education students. Before moving to the Midland area, Heather ran her own daycare center. Sally began her employment with MPS in 2016 as a paraprofessional at Chestnut Hill Elementary, where she supports special education students. Before coming to MPS, Ms. Matula taught special education for many years. 
She has her bachelor's degree from Central Michigan University and a master's degree from the University of Wisconsin, Platteville. Heather and Sally were nominated for The Shining Star by an MPS colleague. Among her comments were the following. These two paraprofessionals are both assigned to a student with a cognitive impairment. In addition to that, the student has a trach, which is a huge medical concern. These two ladies have been through numerous trainings and have collaborated with administration, teachers, nurse, and parents in a very caring, nurturing, and professional manner. They are attentive to the student and handle any and all medical issues that arise at school. They have stepped into a position where they were not formally trained yet. They have shown grace and compassion. I am very lucky to have them as part of my team. Congratulations, Heather and Sally. <laughs> There's Heather's, and there's Sally's, and I got two envelopes for you, and, and here for your oh. teacher. Do you want to carry one for them? Can and, carry and you all can I'll go up and sh shake the board members' hands. You are a lucky girl. Thank you. 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 So we have another presentation, and I'll introduce Penny Miller Nelson, which most, most of you know. She's a coordinator of our secondary instruction, and she will introduce the rest of her team, which she's bringing with her tonight. Good evening. While well, she's doing that, uh, on behalf of our work group, thank you for this opportunity to be here to provide you not only with an update about the, the activities of our work group, but to talk with you about this really important topic, um, the mental health, overall social, emotional, and behavioral well-being of our students. Um, I don't, I'm sure the same happens to you. Those of us involved with educating students receive many communications from professional organizations, research institutes. Not a week goes by where I don't get a communication about this topic. It is part of our national conversation right now, both for students and adults. So we're excited to be here to talk about this and share with you some of the actions we're taking. Uh, you know, we can't do this alone at a school, at our, as a school system. We're well positioned, I think we're ideally positioned to tackle this topic, but we really need our community partners. And this work group is a perfect example of how we're coming together to address this. Um, Hey, I have the controls, how about that? <laughs> uh, typical of our great community, we had the foresight to come together. Key community leaders came together well over a year ago. Uh, Mr. Sharrow was part of that initial group to really talk about what's happening in our community around the topic of mental health. We assessed our needs, identified critical gaps we have in services, and through the leadership of the Midland Area Community Foundation, a leadership team was formed. And they dispatched several smaller work groups to tackle some of these important topics. Uh, jail diversion, suicide prevention, public awareness, and the topic of our group, which is the uh, mental health of school-aged children. So we're really fortunate that there's a community focus on this, and our work group serves at the direction of that larger group. We've created a work plan with very focused action items uh, to be able to accomplish this. And again, uh, through Mr. Sherrill's involvement, I think early on this team recognized that the best path forward, the most direct path forward, was to partner with schools rather than just tell schools what they should do to really become part of what's happening, get input, gather information, and then take action based on that. And that's exactly what we've done. Our work group is uh, small but mighty. We have some really amazing professionals with lots of important letters behind their names um, who really are steeped in, uh, in this profession and helping people who um, are in a mental crisis or have social, emotional, and behavioral needs. And so we're really fortunate to partner with these community organizations. This group is amazing. Uh, we meet twice a month to stay in tune with our action plan, 
to gauge our success. We've been very proactive. We've obtained over $50,000 in grant funds to support the variety of activities that you'll hear about tonight. Uh, and we have great leadership. And Date from Partners in Change here in town really is uh, our leader. We meet regularly at her facility and uh, she keeps us on track, certainly. So we're thankful for that. A lot of great things happening. And with me are two of our team members who can certainly speak to these better than I can. So I'd like to introduce Jackie Warner, who uh, comes to us as a youth intervention specialist from Circuit Court. She's in our schools a lot, working with students and families, and we really appreciate her service. And Christy Hainstock is also with us. She's one of our own here at Midland Public Schools. She is a PhD licensed psychologist and works for us. So I'm gonna turn it over to them, thank you. So here are some statistics. If you look at one out of every five children are impacted by mental health issues, but only 20% ever receive treatment. That means 80% don't. And of those 20% that do receive services, 75% do so in the school, feeling like that's their best option. So 30 to 50% of teens will experience mental health issues before adulthood, and I think that number just continues to increase as we feel a lot of pressure in our community and um, jobs and different things that uh, adults are going through, then it goes on to their kids a lot of times. So the translation would be, let's say we count 7,000 students, 1,400 students have mental health needs in our buildings, it's just a guess and only 280 of those would receive treatment. So we're saying, where can we get the treatment? We need to get that to the schools. What we know, schools are tasked with educating students whose basic mental health and health all kind of go together, well-being. They're not, their needs are not being met. And then feedback from school staff. We have great staff yet they're not trained in some of these big things, and they're seeing, we're seeing a huge increase in anxiety, depression, self-harm, suicidal thinking, substance use, trauma, that's one of our big things that we're seeing, and the counselors are, are very regularly reporting that across the, the board. And this is not, these things are not unique to Midland Public Schools. I'm in the county, they're in every school in our state right now, in, in our country. And then the school counselors are trying to meet the needs but they have to have additional support. They, they need help, they need to feel like they um, can have some direction because their training isn't in mental health a lot of times. So if we think to ourselves, um, picture if right before you came into this meeting, your significant other or best friend just said, done with you, I'm out, I don't wanna talk to you anymore, how would you feel about coming in and being focused on the meeting and paying attention, right? And we can all relate. We've had days, things, hard things that have happened, and our kids are coming into the schools, into the classrooms, and they're seeing parents fight at home, some parents going off to jail, they're seeing parents use substances, they are going through these anxiety, depression kinds of things and trying to be educated. And so without treating that part of things, the, the kids will really struggle with um, how to even manage the classroom. So, uh, what some of the things that we have done already with our group, strengthen the relationships between our community partners, resources, schools. Now, the schools do know who to call, which is wonderful, and then our community has really stepped in. They don't always get, the community doesn't get how things happen with the schools. They just think, well, can't you run groups all day long? And so we've, we've had to kind of teach each that way. Um, collaboration with the counselors, we've tried, tried to give them some screening tools to be able to use. And then a huge part is hosting workshops on these topics to try to get them the training that they're so desperately requesting. So we have the Positive Alternatives to School Suspension Program that started through this GAPS committee. And again, we talked about the funding that we received. It's been a huge help for us being able to start these things. But our middle school students are able to, instead of staying home, playing video games, or um, even having to go to parents' workplaces, they are able to go to this program and learn skills. Part of what we want to make sure we're doing is skill building. We have facilitated Mind Up, uh, the pilot program in third grade classrooms in the county. And so every, um, third grade had at least one class that had mind up 
and then one or two classes that did not, we compared statistics. Uh, many teachers would just rave about, wow, this has been so helpful to be able to teach. I don't know if you've heard of the word mindfulness, but we want to teach uh, youth and even adults how to use more mindfulness. And then we've talked about that, just elevated the conversation. This group is powerful. They've done a lot. I joined the group late. I joined the group about this time, even maybe into the spring, the spring of last year. Um, and the drive and the motivation and the dedication of this group and the work that they have done is phenomenal. But the question is, where do we go next after pass and mind up and all of these things that are really, really meeting the needs of the kids that are showing the greatest mental health needs? Well, we've kind of looked at it this way. And this is similar to an academic um, division of supports. Um, the group is focused primarily on children with the greatest needs, those at the top that are showing the greatest needs. Um, but we know that if we continue to only focus on these kids in crisis, if we focus all of our efforts on the kids showing the greatest need, the numbers showing this level of need will remain the same or go up. Um, so we need to take it lower. We need to focus more on all kids. Um, we need to do this by rallying support. We know that as a group of 12, as powerful as this group of 12 may be, supporting all kids universally, consistently in the area of mental health, social, emotional, behavior skills takes more than 12. Um, so next, what are we doing? We're trying to rally the support and efforts from as many Midland County districts, um, administrators, school teams, supporters, parents, relevant community partners as possible to help shift the focus to um, supporting all kids, those at the bottom of the triangle on up. Um, we need to build a stronger foundation under the roof. Um, we have so far focused on building from the top down, um, and we know that we need to build from the top up. Um, so looking at universally, what can we do? Um, like Jackie said, there's been many national, state, local initiatives focused on mental health. Um, there's many buzzwords, social emotional learning, positive behavior interventions and supports, multi-tiered systems of supports, many acronyms, many ways of describing and talking about how we want to, to build these supports in our schools. Um, but the biggest thing our work group wants you to leave here tonight knowing is that um, supporting the mental health and behavior and emotion and emotional and social needs of kids is not just a thing. It's not an initiative. It's not something that we can pile on top of the many other initiatives that are going on in our buildings. Um, it's a mentality, it's a philosophy, it's a feeling. It's not a thing. Um, so as educators and supporters of children in education, we first have to look at ourselves and make sure, are we showing up every day? Are we presenting ourselves? Are we teaching and modeling skills, um, academic skills, social skills, emotional skills, behavior skills, every day in ways that promote a positive and welcoming culture um, and systems of, of support in, in our school buildings, in all of our school buildings. So I want you to think about this. Just as we teach our children all of the academic skills and prerequisites that they need to be college and career ready, we also need to teach the social, emotional, and behavioral skills and resiliencies that they'll need to be successful in college, career, and life in general. Um, so explicitly teaching and supporting these skills is associated with many, many great things, countless great things. Um, increased self-esteem, more positive and respectful peer and adult interactions, less emotional distress, fewer problem behaviors, and improved academic performance. Um, further, there's recent legislation and educational initiatives. Um, for example, the new seclusion and restraint laws, uh, restorative justice, many new buzzwords, um, many new legislative demands that reiterate this need um, for universal emotional and behavioral supports for all of our kids. Um, don't get me wrong, good things are happening in schools. They're, they're happening every day in our schools, in our district. Um, in one of our middle schools, they're, they're having morning meetings and words of the day where we, they talk about these, these traits, these skills that help build strong, um, strong character and strong people. Um, the zones of regulation in the Mind Up curriculum have been implemented with many subsets of our, of our elementary kids. Um, but the thing is, these things are happening in pockets rather than universally. Um, and they're not necessarily consistent and they're not necessarily embedded with the many other initiatives and programs and things that we have going on in our schools every day. Um, so specific to Midland Public Schools, take the primary years, primary years in international baccalaureate programs. 
um, the PYP and the IAB programs are something that we pride ourselves on. They, they drive our academic curriculum, our structure um, within our schools. Um, it, it guides the way we deliver instruction and academic content within our schools. But what I want you to think specifically about is that learner profile, those 10 traits associated with PYP and IB um, that we believe and that PYP and IB schools believe are critical for students to become responsible members of local, national, and global communities. Um, this learner profile in our schools can and already has to some extent provided some impetus and, and some awareness of the importance of embedding um, and in intertwining these universal social, emotional, and behavior supports um, for our kids. Um, but food for thought, food for thought. These 10 traits, we actually evaluate all of our students on these 10 traits every marking period. Um, we assign them descriptors of progress achieved, developing, not yet, just as we do those academic skills that we assess them on every marking period. Uh, but when you think about the academic skills, we have core curriculum for that. We have reading, writing, math. We have core curriculum to teach those things. Um, so in essence, that implies that we value and teach these behavioral traits, these 10, these 10 characteristics on the learner profile, the same way that we value reading, math, and writing. But I ask you this, do we have that same core curriculum for these, these social, emotional, and behavior skills? And is it delivered universally and consistently? to all of our kids. So that, that's our drive, that's our focus. How can we really get all of these supports in place for our kids to help develop the whole child? Not just the academic piece, not just the, um, the students that we want to leave college and career ready academically, but are we also looking at the social, emotional, and behavioral aspects of those kids and are we teaching and recognizing, acknowledging, reinforcing um, the development of those skills and of the whole <coughs> child to the same extent? <coughs> Um, this is a mission, this is a feeling, this is a culture. So my question to you and our work group's question is how can we unite as Midland Public Schools educators, stakeholders um, in achieving this mission? There are many, many resources out there. Um, there's state and national grants, there's on-site support, there's training and coaching programs, there's, there's many products out there being sold to help um, get this in place in our schools. But resources only can produce meaningful and sustainable outcomes if fully supported by not only school board, administration, um, all stakeholders, but 80% of staff. The research says that unless 80% of staff buy into this vision, this, this goal, that resources are not going to be helpful. We have to, we have to own this. It has to be a feeling. Um, and we know, as a work group of 12, we can't create this feeling and this culture across our county by ourselves. Um, so that's, kind of, that's why we're here today. We're here asking you, and we're also asking district administrators, and we're encouraging teachers and support staff and parents and stakeholders, join us and help us really bring to light the need for this, the importance of this, and the universality of providing these supports. So with that, for us? I have a few questions for you. Yes. That's okay. Um, Christy, if I read that right in, in one of the first couple slides, uh, it sounded like 80% of our students are either untreated or unidentified. Is that a national or is that a, a local statistic? And if, it, and if it's national, where do you think we fall uh, kind of along those lines? So we received those statistics from the University of Michigan, and they were looking at national statistics. My guess is with Midland, we're a little lower than that. That's why I couldn't give you exact numbers, because we haven't studied that. OK. Um, in your opinion, I guess, based on everything that you guys have done, what else can we do as a board, as an administrative team, to help support you guys in, in terms of training staff to identify and deal with with some of these issues and adding to that question you mentioned at the end of your comments um, you need an 80 percent buy-in from from staff where are we on on that scale as well in terms of buy-in from your perspective 
Any number of teachers that we've trained so far, our counselors? You might know that off the Actually, we've <clears throat> hosted several trainings, and they've been voluntary opportunities after school or on weekends. As you know, our professional learning time as a district is coveted, and we uh, allocate that between buildings and districts well in advance and have plans in place. So uh, it isn't something that we are able to do as a district in terms of allocating uh, professional development time for this. We have had um, probably at least 50 teachers participate in a variety of workshops from um, Youth Mental Health First Aid, which is a national curriculum. We had a handful of teachers complete Safe Talk the afternoon of November 7th, which is a suicide prevention program. And we are sending uh, teams of three from each of our secondary buildings, as well as some of our special services staff, to a two-day uh, suicide prevention workshop national curriculum called ASSIST. So I feel like we are doing what we can within the time allocation we have. Uh, you know, the other part of me knows the demands we have on our principals and teachers and curriculum office staff for the other initiatives we have in place. Uh, so I'm not sure we're in a position where we can fully um, devote a year's worth of professional learning time to this. I think we're going to continue. I know our work group is committed to continuing offering these trainings and just really encouraging teachers to attend. So, so Scott, timeline a little bit. Of, um, Jackie, about a year and a half ago, we began to form, and I was the original contact and sat in several of these meetings and was fully supportive. I hope they found that to be true, but they were starting to talk way out of my area. So as I do very well, I delegate, and so Penny, who I give huge kudos to, has done a tremendous job of, of taking that leadership role over and sending her to that committee. And so I would say we are still in the early stages. We're priming the pump and getting more people on board, but remember, pretty good progress for a year, year and a half. The passion of these people over here are incredible. Right, um, Ann Date and her husband were mentioned up there. I, I would tell you they've given us free resources of time and their employees' time and maybe even some curriculum and books, I believe, that are probably in the thousands of dollars. The partners that we got in this community are incredible, and it shows on this side, too. Their passion, is, I think, is why we've got 50 teachers to go, sometimes unpaid, on weekends, evening. We've got some work still to do there, but I, I, I think we're, we're priming the pump and we're on a good start anyway. And I would undoubtedly say that 80% of teachers, probably even pushing 100% of teachers and staff in this district, acknowledge the need for this. Correct. There That's is fantastic. definitely a buy-in to the need. Um, the how-to is the, the challenging part. How do we do this amongst all of the other things that we're asking in a school day? Um, how do we balance this amongst some, so many other things? Um, and that's why the message is this is not a thing, it's a feeling. It's something that we have to work together and strive for um, every day. Can I ask you just a follow up to that and then I'll, I'll pass the floor. Um, as far as the working together, is there anything being done to um, train or involve students in identifying peers that may then be able to go to somebody and say, hey, my friend, I think needs help or needs to talk to somebody? Yes, there are many um, initiatives and many programs and many ways of doing that, both within our schools and within our community. Um, a variety of ways, okay to say, um, a variety of things supported and developed by the work group and more than that, beyond the work so, group. So okay to say has been around for a little while. We weren't using it real well. They took it and began to help us at least get awareness of it out there and beginning to use. Um, maybe not so much identifying other kids, but mind up curriculum, which we piloted, and I'm not sure where you're going on that at, at this time, was to keep kids mentally healthy um, and handle the stresses of life that get us to there. So that being proactive versus reactive, I think you mentioned, Jack, your uh, yeah. has it, really been the goal of this group. Well, I, I really appreciate your time and what you guys have done, and, and with that, I'll. So, I, I mean, knowing the challenge that we have with so much on everybody in the district, is there another community or another district you're modeling after, or do you feel you're trailblazing on this one? So, you know, to look at other communities and how they're approaching this, you know, situation, since every community is dealing with this situation. Yes, there are many, many, many out there um, that are tackling this. Um, some because legislation is in part requiring that as part of the MTSS or multi-tiered support systems. Um, but within Michigan and districts that I've been in, they've tackled it from a variety of different angles. Beyond the state of Michigan, there are many, many models of how to do this very effectively. Um, but the big message is each, in, each district is its own district. 
and has its own needs. Although the, the general idea is the same, in order for us to support kids in a way that's genuine and true to our community, the way that we do that needs to be developed and supported within our community. So there are many models out there, uh, but I think Midland has, and Midland County Schools have continued to kind of work on what's the best for our kids? How do we best support our kids? Uh, so there are many there are many that we can look after, but it's really coming from the inside out rather than the outside in. We visited the University of Michigan Mental, tell me Jackie, do you remember the full name of it? But, but they are work partnering with schools and they've partnered with some schools, Dexter I'm thinking and mm -hmm. Ann Arbor uh, schools for sure. And so they're slightly ahead of us in that partnership with University of Michigan and what they're doing there. So there's some, there are some good models very close mm -hmm. to us to begin to look at, so. For the last several years or for a number of years, I've um, heard reports and we were just recently at the school board conference about secondary schools and starting later in the day, and they're finding that um, that makes positive impacts on the kids in relation to suicide anxiety because of their, you know, their natural teen clock. Do you have any um, comments on that? I'm just kind of curious. I don't know any statistics, but I've heard that a lot, that they're saying um, kids' brains, they need to have more sleep in the morning, and so to start later would be very important. Our work group has not tackled that yet, but that could be one of the things we look at. Where are you in your grant cycle? Is this the end of the $50,000 grant, or is this for the whole year? Actually, we just obtained these grant funds. We've used them to uh, pay for the training that we've done so far, including that December assist training. Uh, we have plans for that as well. Some of that grant money is being used to run uh, cognitive-based therapy groups at our two high schools. We're uh, working with community partners. Our schools have identified students who um, have a need for this. And Jackie's been working closely with our assistant principals and counselors <coughs> to facilitate that process. And so part of that grant money is being used to offset the cost of that. So we're early. To answer your question, we're kind of early but in that. But then it going to pass as well, because some grant funds are there as well. And I've written, wrote you to, about, to you about PASS, but Penny can explain it. kind of came from this work group. Well, it did, as well as part of your vision for yeah. what we should be doing as a piece of restorative discipline practices. So it's only happening right now in our two middle schools when a student is uh, referred to the office the assistant principal has a conversation with that student and makes a determination whether the PASS program would be a good fit. And it's an alternative. It's an alternative to out of school suspension. As Jackie said, we know students go home sometimes and aren't in the best environments or left on their own. And so this is a way for them to build skill, um, to uh, have an opportunity to work on some homework. And uh, where possible, we are trying to weave in a community service portion, which does lend more to that restorative piece. Uh, we just are, are meeting soon, uh, next week, I think, to talk about our status of that. Uh, so far, great success. Our two middle schools have been tremendous in just stepping forward and giving this a try. We sort of built it as we went, which can be a little tough on those assistant principals in the moment, trying to shuffle the paper and check all the boxes. But I think it's really forcing a conversation between the assistant principal and the student to talk about what's best and uh, try to move that student back into the, the right direction where they're not making the same mistakes and they're building skills to do that. The work group would really love to see that scale to high school. Um, we're not sure that financially we can support that uh, long term but we think that we can at least take the next step and begin using that in, in high school. And I think both of our high schools are excited to talk more about that. Who works Who works with those students then that are? That That's are a great question. I can't believe I didn't even mention that. I'm so sorry. So we partner with The Rock, and Bev Wenzel uh, helped create this program. They have trained staff who are there at the community center to, to greet these students. That's where the, the program is held. We provide uh, a meal to those students and actually provide that service to the other students in the county because uh, all of the schools are partnering this and sending students, which makes it a really special opportunity. So yeah, they've um, helped create a curriculum that's used that is based on the skills that students need uh, in the moment based on their discipline and fraction. And uh, as I said, we're, we keep improving it as we go, but The Rock has been a great partner in this. So I have no concept on a daily basis how many kids are in there. 
Well, it's not necessarily day to day, and uh, we certainly leave it to the assistant principal's discretion to know who best can take advantage of this program. Um, I would say we've probably had 45 students access the program or 45 um, incidences where students have utilized PASS already this school year. I can certainly supply you with the true and actual numbers after this meeting. What, what have your results been from those 45 interactions? Uh, results in terms well, of... With, with the kids, are they going back and are they heading down the right road? Right. Are they going back and still doing what put them there in the first place? So that's a great question. That's one thing that we're grappling with in terms of measuring success. Certainly if student A attends pass and never has another discipline incident, that's success for us. But we also know that maybe what happened in this situation was a very different situation than their next discipline uh, infraction. So it's hard to really track based on the what we're considering are there areas of skill building that are needed. Overall, our intent is to have less students out of a classroom, away from direct instruction and collaborative work with their peers in a classroom setting. So that's ultimately how we're going to measure it, is seeing a decrease in discipline overall. Great. Would you add anything to that? I would just, I would just say, you know, with some kids it takes 12 or 13 years to develop some of these behaviors. So to fix it in six hours in one day probably isn't going to happen. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> So when you're referred, uh, does that mean you'll only go to the program at the Rock for one day, or could it be over time? Or? It depends. Um, typically what we're doing is, you know, we have pretty strict policies and practices of um, what you do and what the result is. And so again, assistant principals are working with students and families to make those decisions. A student can go there for multiple days. They can go there for one day. Or sometimes if it's a longer term suspension, maybe they serve a few days at home and a few days at pass. We're really seeing a combination of how we're using this. One size doesn't fit all. Right, <laughs> right. Any other questions? Do we have have room for more? Are you finding yourself maxed out, or do you have room to take in? Do you have 100, 100 well, more referrals? Bev tomorrow, Wenzel has a real heart for this work. So she is always saying to us, we will take however many you send. Of course, there's some magic in the ratio you have of students to adults. And if we do scale up to high school, we want to be mindful of you know, a potential sixth grader uh, in the same space as a high schooler. So we do have to work through some of those logistics. Um, right now, we've never exceeded their capacity. She has a system where one uh, staff member is always there and uh, one or two are on call as needed based on the number of referrals for a particular day. I really appreciate the connection with the learner profile and the PYP. One of the things that I was so excited about with the IB program and the PYP in the elementary schools is that learner profile and how it does connect the social emotional um, skills, strengths of kids. And um, I think that's a very positive direction for us to go. It's a good start anyway. So I appreciate your help and, mm -hmm. and all you do. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Mm -hmm. Moving into item 3.3 for action, summer tax collection request. Good evening. Um, as I do on an annual basis, uh, by state requirement, if we want the city to collect in the summertime, um, you have to pass the resolution before January 1st telling them that. As you know, we collect within the city of Midland our taxes in both the summer and the winter tax collection. The other uh, tax uh, authorities throughout the county we do just once uh, during the winter they collect ones, but since the city collects twice we do that, it is uh, helpful to us as far as, uh, if, as you remember, Mike's talked numerous times about the uh, low cash point, which usually happens in September when we're not getting cash payments. That's also the time that the first of the summer taxes come in, so it's a, it's a good thing for us to do. So it requires you to uh, uh, pass a resolution here to uh, ask the city of Midland to collect it for the summer, and then we in turn turn that on to the city for uh, uh, announcing that we're going to do that with them. So, fires the vote on your part. You have the resolution, uh, yep. the action item in front of you. <clears throat> All right, I will entertain a motion at this time. Okay, I move to approve the resolution certifying the tax rate that is to be levied in the summer of 2018 on the property of the school district 
within the City of Midland. A complete copy of the resolution shall be attached to the original of these minutes. Support. All right. Moved by Scott. Support by Mary. Is there any discussion on this? All right. Seeing none, I think Cindy had thought we need a roll call vote on this. It's so, best. given that, if you would do the honors, please. Of course. President Branset. Yes. Vice President Singer. Yes. Treasurer Frizee. Yes. Member Baker. Yes. Member Blazy. Yes. Member Friedel. Yes. I also vote yes. All right. Seven yes votes. Seven out of seven. Get out your checkbooks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mean just host that living in the city. <laughs> <laughs> No. All right, moving into 3.4 for action, property and casualty insurance. Back Again, to you. Again, this is our renewal of our property and casualty insurance for the district. Uh, just a couple of items that I'll point out to you. If you see uh, the listing of our contents, uh, a year ago, uh, that would have been about $4.7 million less. Uh, as you know, we've brought on facilities. We've lost some facilities. Kind of washes out, but of course, what we just built and what we furnished, et cetera, content. Uh, the content that we're insuring is up about 4.7 uh, million. The actual uh, cost, uh, 208,999, is about $700 uh, more than a year ago. So a very, very slight increase in all intents and purposes with the, uh, uh, the increase in what we're insuring. It's really not an increase. It's the same rate that we had a year ago. And always just list a few of the items there that insurance policy covers. So we did this out a year ago, and we do every, every three or four years. All right, at this time, I will entertain a motion. I move to approve item 3.4 for uh, action, property, and special insurance. Support. All right, moved by Pam, support by Scott. Is there any discussion? I had three questions, and all of them were answered by Bob and Mike, so. Excellent. Any other questions? Uh, can you tell us what the previous policy, um, what it cost? I know you and I talked briefly about it before our meeting. It was a 208-201, I think it was. Okay. And then the years prior, you mentioned they were up to yeah, 230 it, it, range? Yeah, if you go back, uh, especially before we started mm -hmm. giving any taking buildings away, we would have been in about the 220s to 230s okay. on, a, on a premium. So that trying to think back now it's hard to believe with the, the bond but as we've taken properties offline if you will but we don't have any uh, buildings still standing there uh, it's come down a little so that that was my point is that it seems like a lot of money for a one-year policy but there are savings yep. built into that all right any other questions or comments I had a couple questions all right um, I know you're only bidding it out every couple of years but with the change in insurance right now, the things in trending down in some of these for property, um, I would highly encourage that we would quote this out on a more frequent basis. But also dealing with somebody like our local agent who's an independent, did they offer up a matrix of a comparison of the vendors that they supply, that they support? You know, there's probably a dozen different companies that they represent or can sell as an independent agent. Did they bring forth a matrix to us as a comparison of how this would compare to other <coughs> insurances that they represent? They would give us the lowest quote with the vendors that they have and that they can provide so they would, would go with, with the, I should always add, with the services <coughs> that we want. I mean, you can, uh, I could go in there and tell them I wanted uh, a deductible of Five hundred. They, they can insure anything, as you as you know. But with what our, uh, our requirements are for deductible and the amount of coverage, replacement, etc., uh, they will find from their vendors the lowest cost vendors that we could use. So they don't present necessarily when I'm talking to them the other vendors that are uh, that they access. They would give me the ones that present the lowest policy in that classification, whatever it happens. To so is this the same company as we had last year? The biggest part of the policy is, I don't know if I want to tell you that the um, different smaller parts are there. Um, it's, uh, it's 
it's not something that I would always ask which, which company that we're with. Um, the, the biggest part of this, the uh, buildings and content is the same. I think the auto is the same too, because that's the one I looked at, the, the two biggest parts. But they did quote that out to other people during this, before this. Yeah, program. whenever you go back to them, especially the independents, like you said, they're an independent agent, they go just back like they're finding that for you at the time. So it's not just as they would when it was a big bid, opened up to all the companies a year ago. They'll do the same thing every time, but with their, uh, I guess I call it group of vendors that they can access. Which as we've worked with them, we find it sometimes it's interesting. Some do have exclusive ones. There's a lot of overlap. It's kind of interesting to watch how they put it together. Because a lot of our independent local agents have access to some of the same exact same vendors. Yeah. So we'll sure. get different prices with different vendors, same company. It's kind of interesting. All right. That's your Brent's done. Oh, are you I, done, Brent? Um, <clears throat> the issue of our coverage, did that, uh, our issue with the, the Jefferson pool, did that come up in conversation and renewal of this policy? It's, it's, if you remember, there are three uh, locations that do not have flood insurance on them. And so uh, we certainly can add it. It's always at a, at a cost. So we did discuss it again, but those are the ones that they uh, have for years, uh, long before my time, carved out because of the cost associated if you wanted to do it. The one thing they did, because I asked in particular about Jefferson Pool when I was in there, um, they are pretty sure that even with flood insurance, we would have problems because um, technically it came from below the pool. It was the underground part, and flood insurance typically does not cover underground. Mm -hmm. So the problem would be, they said they've run into this with other people that had flood insurance, is like where, where we housed all the pool equipment that all was flooded, and that's where the hydraulic pressure came from underneath, that, that most likely, even with flood insurance, wouldn't have been covered under the I did ask them about that. We did also look back at history, too, just to make sure. Because um, I did ask them once to say, well, why'd they cover it up? Um, this is the first time that they can see any place, as long as they've been our agent, that, that we've actually had a flood at one of those places. And like I said, when I asked this time, they thought it might not be covered. Uh, they're pretty sure with their experience of the places because it was under, it came from underground the dam. I guess I'd only have one other request is that if uh, a line item like this, I'd like to have the backup in the packet of what the quote was. Because it's in the agenda, actually, and there's not any backup. But it could be from the Eider's letterhead, whatever it may be. I'd like to see something in our packet for that instead of in the agenda. That'd be my last comment. Like the whole policy? Do you want all the policies there? No, it should be a sum policy summary. It should be a three to five page deal max of the whole thing that would represent the 200,000, 210,000. It might even be shorter than that. It might be two or three pages of the full. Well, Brad, I, and I'm not sure we're talking the same, but there, we, we have it broke down though for you, and did you, did you see that that way? Right. But but we've got building and contents, and we have uh, equipment breakdown each price, violent event response. Did you see all that? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm sure that Bob has a quote, and or we can get a, an actual executive summary of the quote. <coughs> have that as part of this. All right. Any other comments or questions? All right. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed. All right. We have our property and casualty insurance for next year. All right. Moving into item four, request to address the board. Anyone here who would like to address the board this evening? No? Are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> We'd love to hear from you. Yes. Everyone? Put your hand up. Excellent. Yeah, come on up. Come on up. <laughs> Extra credit right there. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So as of now, there's like a lot. Oh, wait. I think we need to start. We have a, yeah. <laughs> So you need to state your name and your address. Oh. And then just so you know, everybody gets five minutes. Okay. 
<laughs> I'm Haley Serbrook, and my address is 4314 here on Drive. And right now, there's a, like, a law, a bill going through the House and, like, the Congress about, like, concealed carry. And I was, like, if that passes, I was wondering, like, because I know Midland High got some new um, security measures, and I know, like, how, like, we don't have, like, metal detectors or anything. Like, how is that going to protect us from someone that's, like, able to carry a gun, like, in places like school and now? Very good question. I would I would um, tell you that we need to be very proactive and talk to our legislators about that because it's not done yet. If you recall, <clears throat> it's made out of the Senate to go to the House. So when they come back from Thanksgiving break, they'll take action on that. And then it has to go to the governor. And if you recall, this legislation came up a couple of years ago, similar, and the governor vetoed it. And so I, I don't think we're done fighting the legislation because from at least from a superintendent's viewpoint, I don't think it's good legislation. But if it does occur, um, we've been under this somewhat before with open carry. Um, we would go into a um, secure mode um, at, at that point in time if we know there is a carrier in the building. And we would restrict that carrier to the office. And if they're there to see somebody, we would bring that person to the office to see them. So we do have some procedures in place that we've used in the past, um, but yet still yet to be seen where that legislation goes and where our ability to control or not control. I believe it should be local control and not state mandated control over this, but that's my opinion at this point. So if you feel strongly about this, I would encourage you to write or call your legislators. And Mike, just to add to that, if I understand the way that it's being proposed, we would still as a district have the ability to, to maintain, a, say that we're weapon free, and then we could just say that if there is a person carrying um, I think we could identify them as just being a trespasser and, and have them uh, no. removed if that's... No, that's right now going. where we are. And so um, the, the current legislation would um, allow open carry, except for there was Ann Arbor schools um, restricted because they said they, they had local control over the issue and they won in court. And right. so over the last, and don't hold me to the six months to a year, we've been operating as schools that we have the ability to restrict this weapon-free zone. Um, and so that's the reaction to today to the legislation is that they're coming back and saying, well, well we're going to close open carry, but concealed carry, and by the way, no local policy can overrule our policy. Mm -hmm. And so we would not be able to restrict it being on our campuses. What we could do is how, we, how do we procedurally handle that? And my, my fear isn't so much actually the date with the school, because we're pretty secure. We don't let a whole lot of people walk down our hallways anymore. Right. And we, we hold them at the office for the most part. My fear is stadiums, basketball games, <laughs> um, those type of things where you already fight some emotionalness mm -hmm. at, at time, mm -hmm. times at that. And so um, I think we should point those issues out to our legislators, which I have written, wrote to you guys many times, and I have, and um, unsuccessfully at this point. So I think for me and our professional organizations, we're now put, pinning some hope and some talk on the governor. You all have voices too. Yeah, I was going to say, and you're you're really affected pens. by this, so please contact our state legislatures and express your concern. That was a great question. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank up. you yeah. very much. <laughs> okay, one brave soul. Who's next? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Moving on to item five, which is our curriculum instruction and assessment. So I guess there were minutes. I do. Pam? I okay. See, we met on Monday, October 16th at 2.15. We talked about one-on-one -on -one devices, uh, K through five. Dave Vitek and Melissa Toner presented logistics on training efforts related to the kindergarten through fifth grade one-to-one -one device rollout in September. A discussion also ensued on the future of one-to-one -one, one devices, including digital intervention, online curriculum, and potential bring-your-own-device policies. In addition to the discussion, the committee toured several classrooms to see the devices in action. We adjourned at 3.30. It was a, a great day at, at Central Park Elementary, <laughs> and it was uh, wonderful to go into the classrooms and see how they were using devices and what we saw um, were different engagements wherever you looked and it was you know in, in some classrooms you would see the teachers working um, uh, 
with their students, um, with uh, using devices and instruction and other areas, you would see two or three students working in front of a monitor together on um, some kind of projects, and the others were, um, I think we saw robotics. Yeah, Did we see robotics, robotics in there that day, too? So it was uh, a lot of different engagement with technology. It was uh, a great, great tour. <laughs> The kids were uh, working on, um, in one of the classrooms, they were working individually, and that gave the teacher uh, an opportunity to work one-on-one -on -one with a student, maybe for, for some additional help in something. It was, it was really nice, and the kids were really engaged in what they were doing and had their little headsets on, and so they w were working individually, but uh, could be listening to stories or reading along. It's really nice. The other thing I noticed is the teachers with the um, uh, mics. mics and how easy it was to hear no matter where you were in uh, that classroom or, uh, or right outside the classroom setting. All right, thank you very much. Moving into item six, which was our FFO, our last meeting. Patrick. Yep, we met November 13th. Um, present were <clears throat> myself, Angela, Pam, Mike, Bob, and Daryl from Barton Mallow. We discussed a few topics. The first uh, was bond issues. Daryl. Darrell reviewed and discussed with the FFO committee the current bid schedule in Series 1 bond financials uh, awarded and remaining to date. Second were finance and operations topics. Uh, Bob and Mike reviewed and discussed the following items with the committee. Number one, September financials. Number two, the purchase of, purchase of the district's property and casualty insurance, which we discussed tonight uh, at length. Uh, number three, summer tax collection request to the city, which we discussed earlier. Uh, four, the Preliminary discussion of the Midland County Wide Enhancement Millage Renewal, 2018. Probably be an important topic coming up here. Mm -hmm. And number five, the Michigan School of Finance Research Collaborative Resolution. Our next meeting is Monday, December 11th at 5 o'clock. All right, excellent. Thank you very much. Moving into 6.2, did you want to? I have uh, for look information at this to start long with. list. Totals of $6,873.85. <clears throat> It is quite a long list because there are numerous ones that make that one up. You'll notice uh, they kind of run the gamut. There's a fair amount of robotics in here. Mm -hmm. um, but you'll see uh, from different organizations, but uh, also we had an award winner, uh, Beth Quinby at uh, Chestnut Hill, that gave some money there. We have some uh, personal donations to the Science Olympiad, <coughs> to the uh, Jefferson team. JPAC, the Jefferson Parent Advisory Committee, as a list, a very typical start of the year to CPTOs and groups uh, kind of having a, uh, a way to hand out the, what money they've raised. You see that? And of course, also from the first robotics group, the Great Lakes Bay region, with some money to help some groups out in the Seabird PTO. And you'll see the Battle of the Books uh, down there. So that's for information. Uh, 6.3, it requires action because of the size of the gift $75,000. It was given to the Central Park. Elementary Student and Family Enhancement Fund, and that's from Memorial Presbyterian Church. Uh, they're next door neighbors, so because of the size of that gift, it requires your approval. All right, a wonderful, wonderful gift. At this time, I'll entertain a motion. I'll move that we approve item 6.3, a gift totaling $75,000 uh, from Memorial Presbyterian Church. Support. All right, moved by Scott, support by Mary. Any discussion other than the obvious? Wow. Yeah, yeah. how generous. Yeah. I wonder what will that, the $75,000 go for? That was, um, they approached us um, last spring, Brian and I and Bridget and Shannon met with them, <coughs> and um, we decided that it was going to be needed to give um, opportunities to those students who couldn't afford for things such as robotics or after school programming, um, uh, that nature, I think, would sum it up on Brian. And so that is where that money will lie, and um, Bridget and Shannon have the ability to use it in that manner. All right, any other comments or discussion on this? Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? All right, thank you to Memorial Presbyterian Church and thank you to all the other donors. There's one more piece for information because it's a gift, so mm -hmm. it's not cash value there, but we also had donated a uh, clarinet to two music stands in a French horn case from Ms. Robin Glenn. All right, thank you very much. All right, moving into item seven, which is human resources. 
Do you want to take this? Janet's now doing those. Oh, sorry, Janet. That's okay. <laughs> um, the following staff members announced their retirement effective as of these dates. Beverly Charbonneau, a paraprofessional at Woodcrest, is effective June 14th of 18. Deborah Morgenstern, a paraprofessional at H.H. Dow High School, December 31st, 2017. And the board and staff extend their deepest sympathies to the family of Mark Pobosik, who passed away on October 23rd, 2017. Mr. Pobosik was a teacher at Jefferson for 17 years, retiring in 2014. Right. Actually, he worked at Central for a couple years, because I worked at Central with him. And he was kind of, I think he was in elementary, too, somewhere. Yeah, it's too bad. Yep. Yeah, no, it's a shock because my kids were both there at Jefferson when he was there. So. Yeah, it's too bad. All right, moving into item eight, which is correspondence to and from the Board of Education as recorded in the agenda. Um, 8.2 is information letters to the Board of Education. Nine is scheduled activities. So note that our next and last regularly scheduled board meeting of 2017 will be December 18th. And at this time, we will move into study discussion. And, um, okay, I think, do you have the slips of paper? The Board of Education Officer Nominating Committee? Okay, why don't we go through this and then we can do that as part, or do you want me to? Okay, that's what I thought. We'll go into our discussion and you can find seven slips of paper. All right, so Brad, I will start with you on the hearing from board members. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you to Penny, Christy, and Jackie uh, for their presentation. And Christy did mention that they're having great success, but it's only in pockets right now. Um, so I think that we as a board and a district need to be ready to plan and prepare help them with grants and also budget line items in the future when they know that uh, how to target this money and how to improve their training and get m more of their message out there and help all of our children that uh, I think to deepen their pockets we might have to deepen their pockets but just for awareness thanks all right, thank you Mary um Congratulations to our speaker there that came up and, and asked a question. I think it's a I think it's a really important question and, and I would reiterate again that you um, should contact um, our legislature and the governor, you know, it, and it's easy to do online because I've done it. So please do. Mm -hmm. Good meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, happy Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. Hey, all right. <laughs> I had the pleasure of attending the Michigan Association School Board Conference so last week, I don't know, recently here. And uh, always interesting, always a good chance to talk with board members from here and other districts. Um, attended some good classes, learned, I think I've always learned a bunch. It's always good to come back. Um, I voluntarily sat through a couple of finance classes on bond and bond work and how all that works. <laughs> and uh, it was good, it was informational. And I think Mike's letter last Friday mentioned about our our this district's credit rating uh, being upgraded to an A plus, and it's another way of how our fund balance allows us to save money mm -hmm. in ways you don't always think of. Um, so I think that is encouraging to hear. And uh, looking looks like my correct Plymouth and Woodcrest will be wrapping up here soon. They're phase one. Correct. correct. Phase one. Yep. It'll so at that point they'll hand over <clears throat> those newly built areas, but then of course take over. Correct. For the old areas, and, and then they'll be all done. Their goal is to be done, um, help Bob, end of May, before school probably lets out. Although they're proud of that and they want us to kind of move there, but with a few weeks to go, I don't know that's really going to happen, but okay. uh, cause it just may not be worth it to move at that point. But yeah, sounds Ho like May. Hopefully, parents and students are ready at the for the next round at Siebert and Chestnut Hill, which is to be the next round of improvements coming. So, I'm looking forward to seeing. Seeing all that, I bet you are. <laughs> <laughs> Your children at the multiple reasons. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. Think that's it. All right, thank you, Scott. Uh, oh, who is also looking forward to the next round? <laughs> it, it was a great presentation tonight about the school mental health. Um, for me, it was kind of eye-opening uh, because it is a very real 
issue in our schools, not only locally, um, but on a, a regional and national level. And it's a problem that um, you know students deal with, and, and, and teachers and administrators deal with daily. Uh, the statistics are staggering. Uh, you know, 80% nationally go untreated and unidentified. Uh, the good news is, is we are really charging forward here uh, to help these kids out um, and to make progress and to you know, trailblaze, in a sense, mm -hmm. um, like you put it, uh, to get the treatment, to get the training, to get the identification processes and procedures in place. So I was really happy to see the progress that they've made um, to that end. Um, to all of you, you guys can start a movement here. Help us help you. Uh, you guys need to contact our legislators. And, and uh, it's beating a dead horse, I know. And, and you were very brave to come up and do that, and we all appreciate it. Uh, but you can see the power that you have. If all of you left and had 10 of your friends make a phone call or write a letter, uh, that's a big thing. And, the, and you can start a movement throughout our district, and hopefully beyond that, to get the legislation passed that we really need to have passed. So that's really all I wanted to, to emphasize tonight. And thank you all for, for sticking with us. We should write a letter to uh, Mr. Starling to see if we extra But only to one of you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you mean for, for writing. I just thought you meant for speaking and bringing it to, the, to everybody's forefront. I agree with you. The presentation tonight was um, great. And we do need to focus. Um, on the social emotional pieces for our kids and so many I, a big kudos to the, the schools and what we have done and partnered um, with uh, community mental health and so many of the other agencies um, to help address this problem and and that's one thing I'm very proud of the district is we have a lot of people who are engaged and ready to jump on board to, to help um, move this forward so and Mr. Shero has been on board for from the go, from the get-go. So that's been wonderful. Uh, I guess I would challenge all of us, all the students out there, and all the parents that it's not just a school. It's not a school issue. It's a community issue. It is every one of us. It is every parent, every aunt, uncle, grandparent, and student. And when we see someone struggling, we can't always look to teachers to solve it. We need to look at ourselves and see what kind of difference we can make with each one of um, these kids in our community. So um, I just encourage us all to take a, a harder look at that. Um, another thing, speaking of uh, strong so social emotional skills, it wasn't long ago where we approved a book, Wonder, here. And now there's a PBS. Um, special about wonder have anyone seen I've, I've heard great reviews about it and um, it just also the movie is out and it and everyone is talking about the book and, and uh -huh. it really addresses some of those social emotional um, strengths and and how we can um, just be better friends on another note, Patrick, uh, the MS, MASB conference was fabulous. Uh, we were up every morning at 7.30 in the morning, and we didn't get out of class until 9.30 at night. And that was 30, Thursday through Saturday. So got home at midnight Saturday night, but it was well worth it. And we had a lot of great breakout sessions, a lot of uh, classes that we went to. And I would highly encourage board members to go next year because um, we really um, get a lot out of it every year, and it's important. Um, Dow High had a GLOW event that was yeah. uh, a super success and, and, and giving back to the community, and I think they were really taken in that WE message that uh, we're partnering with Dow Chemical on uh, the WE movement. So it was great to see the students really embrace that. And then Midland High uh, had their own um, day where they honored the veterans. And um, that was uh, uh -huh. just a, a wonderful thing to see our schools do. That's all I have. Well, I agree. It's a great, great meeting, great time of year. Um, thank you, students. There's a lot of you here today. So um, and Haley, for being brave to come up. And I'll just echo what everyone else said. And they talked about this even at our conference. 
it's so important for you and parents and community members to contact legislators. They said school board members and administrators can, but you are the ones that really have the power. So if you can do that, get on your email and, or your phone and give them a call and let them know what you think about the different issues. Uh, and thanks for being here tonight. Um, I was pretty moved by our shining stars again t tonight. Oh. Um, it just shows what goes on in our schools that most people don't notice, but it's an everyday thing. There are always people reaching out and giving, and I think that with with the topic of discussion tonight on the school from the school mental health group, you know, we're making great strides, and and there are great things going on, but um, we are a little bit ahead of the game because we saw a lot of uh, some vendors and discussion about that at the conference. So there is. Um, different kinds of curriculum and, and um, guidelines out there. So it's exciting to know that we are already making efforts to uh, help our students. Uh, let's see what else I have here. Yeah, there's so many schools. Pam touched on the GLOW dance, but I saw there was a penny drive and there's been food collections and all kinds of things going on. And uh, what a generous community we have. And it's starting at such a young level our age that uh, hopefully these will continue and be uh, life skills that all these students uh, carry on in their adult lives. Um, Alice in Wonderland, I went the other night, Dow High performed that and our own um, Midland High graduate Gina Kearley actually wrote that and helped direct it. So I knew her when she was just a young girl so it was fun to go see that and I believe Rhapsody Rendezvous is coming up next. So. I always look forward to that. So you are also talented. And Thanksgiving is Thursday, so I'm sure you're all ready for a little break. And um, enjoy it. Well deserved. All right. Well, I think most people touched on most everything, except I do need to send a shout out to the Dow High Girls swim team that finished ninth in the state <laughs> Saturday. Um, I think it might be the last fall sport to wrap up. So. Um, congratulations to that team and um, feel good story I saw on Facebook um, a few weeks ago but I kind of kept it in mind so with both of our high schools out of the football um, championship series there was a large it was actually a pretty large group of Dow High kids that went over to Grand Rapids one night to watch a former student from Dow High who had to transfer for his senior year over to Grand Rapids and a huge group of them went over to um, support him in his playoff game the following week after um, both Dow and Midland were out. And I just, I don't know, it kind of touched me because I thought for them to do that and to go support a former um, student in his new school, I thought was um, touching. So congratulations to the Shining Stars. Um, both my kids had Julie Villano, so we know her and like her. And she was great as an English teacher, and now she is administrator. Um, that is all I have for that. I think at this time I will hand out for um, the nominating, if that's good, and then we'll turn it over to sure. you why we do that. So um, a couple of you have not been um, here for this part before. You're probably at the meeting last year, though, where we did this. Um, so what we do is every um, at this time every year, we, amongst the seven of us, elect um, three of us to serve as the nominating committee for the, two th well, this will be for the 2018 um, board year. And that group of three are the three that sit down and figure out the slate, the officer slate, and a lot of the committee positions and, you know, the whole, how everything gets um, divided up. So what we do is everyone gets a slip of paper, check your three, everybody's name is on here, check your three. Put it up here. You can fold it, and Cindy will um, collect them, tally them, and at the end, or when she has it done, she will give it to me. I will um, let you know. The three people then um, get together outside of a regular meeting. All right. There you go. It's time all. I can speak Turn. while you're writing. Yep, that's what, that's <laughs> what I figured. See, I'm trying to multitask here. Okay. <laughs> Um, I wrote to you a little bit about our energy incentives, and I want to give uh, Mike Mogenberg um, a lot of credit here. Mike works very hard on these rebates, and you saw the history there where we have a um, like significant number of rebates. In five, I think we're up to four buildings that received the Energy Star as well, so um, that's a really nice uh, 
flow back to the district and we've been kind of depositing that money for future facilities as we know we we got continued work that we're going to need to do to bring our facilities up, up to where we'd like them to be over time above the bond work as we go um, as patrick met, uh, mentioned um s p global does a review of our credit um, every couple of years i think but i think they're getting ready as well because we're probably about a year out from selling series two or is it six months out i think and so um, they review your credit ratings as we go. As you know, we've made great progress, but it was nice to hear an organization like that. And the voicemail message was probably more flattering than the new the letter, but they were um, quite surprised of the turnaround that we had. And we, as we know, I don't think we ever projected that we'd build our fund balance, do probably double uh, in that short period of time and higher than we ever wanted. So we've been moved to an A plus rating, uh, which last time with our A rating, um, we had we used the state's rating because the state's rating was actually higher than ours, and so that, that may be the case not the case this time going forward, which allows you to sell your bonds at a more attractive rate and better to the taxpayers. Not to, doesn't bring more money into us, but it, it'll pay off their debt quicker for the taxpayers as we go. Enrollment, we're, we're really close to certifying the numbers any day, so we're always very cautious. Um, if you remember, I was a little mo more early last year on you a little bit, and so I'm not going to do that again, but. It looks like we're about 50 students above budget um, at this point in time, um, which would put us darn near the same um, enrollment we had last year, despite the two high schools going smaller classes and getting significantly smaller. So again, as we've talked about, <clears throat> that's been a nice problem to have at the elementary, but it's also cost of classroom space issues that um, we'll talk about as we go forward. Open carry, we talked about that tonight, and so I won't go into grade two, but Senate bills 584 through 586 address with that they've been approved um, the, the expectation is when the house returns that they most likely will be approving um, uh, hopefully we've done some work maybe that doesn't completely occur um, and, and make sure you understand I say this from somebody who um, is very much a gun advocate and, and myself but from a school administrative standpoint I, I don't believe this would be a good thing for us going forward I liken it to I, I try to look at it and say you know after 9-11 <clears throat> If we had everyone carrying on planes, would that would make planes safer? Because that's really what they're saying. So if schools have been the, uh, the, the target, or public settings have been the target, and if we just had people carrying guns, they wouldn't be the target, then why is that not true on planes? And we don't let everyone carry on planes. We license somebody who's carrying on that plane. And that's really where we should be going. It should be about security guards or paying for metal detectors, as you mentioned earlier, or or let's put a liaison in every school in America. Um, I, I think that's the better way of making safety as we go forward. So I think we need to work on that. I hold out that Governor Snyder still stands where he st stood um, two years ago when he vetoed going forward. County Enhancement Village, I wrote to you about that as well. Two parts of that one. Um, there is a bill um, that, that would allow <coughs> charter schools to en enact in that um, money as well. About a $100,000 hit for us. Um, the issue that I really have with it more than anything is I'm sure when our voters approved that millage, they meant to tax themselves to spend more on educating Midland County students. And approximately the enrollment at the, our charter schools are 40 to 50 percent non-Midland County residents. And so you're now sending Midland County residents to educate students outside of our county. And I think they need to fix that loophole. And that's where I've been pushing um, significantly hard on our legislators with some death, death years at this point in time, so not, not real good there. Um, it is becoming time where we have to renew our enhancement knowledge. If you recall, when I first came in, um, we discovered it was a very short timeline, and I pushed hard, so we got it on the ballot before we, we didn't have a collection. You always like a buffer election date, meaning if you weren't successful, you still are collecting, and you could go back and try to re-educate the community why this is important and, and do so. And so we are looking, and it has to be, um, make sure you understand, we may be the largest 70% of the portion, but this is ESA driven, it's countywide driven. They're the, they're the ones that can request. So we're working with our ESA. We're probably gonna request two election dates for approval, August of 2018 and November of 2018. And so if you're successful in August, you'd be done. Um, you'd pull it back for November. If not, you could go back in November um, and educate them. Both are um, election dates where there are other things on the ballot, state or national, if you recall how that works. If it's state or national, we don't foot the bill. And so August is a primary, November is of, of 18th, the, the governor election year. So that's good as well. Um, 
31A and literacy grant funds, some very nice exciting news and using our resources targeted at our interventions and our gaps and our goals. And so 625,000 supplementary funds went to, into our 10 schools for at-risk students. Another 114,000 went into literacy grant funds to uh, provide interventions in literacy for our youngest learners, K through three for the third grade initiative. And um, so we, we 512,000 were 31A funds as well. So really nice money and we hope to continue to close our achievement gap as we go forward with that piece. Mentioned earlier, um, Woodcrest and Plymouth nearing um, completion on phase one. If you recall at Woodcrest, um, and Mary and Brad may not, because it may have been before you guys, I don't remember if we did or not, but we, um, we decided that Woodcrest had this odd, um, they had four sections at every grade level, okay. but with mm -hmm. one grade level of three, which causes a problem. We kind of helped maybe um, t by hold, not approving school of choice and maybe the draw center park, that wouldn't be an issue. And we, we got enrollment and we re realized that you guys were here by then mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't gonna work. And so when we began to look at adding a classroom onto there, we realized that the STEM maker space where it was at was probably a better classroom and then we could add STEM maker space. So they have the classroom already, but now with the addition um, is the STEM maker space. And so that is out to bid. Those numbers will come back to you, FFO, to the board. That's coming to you to be prepared for as well. Um, we think we can cover that through contingency funds and um, cost savings through there. So um, that's good news. I think we can afford it without having any change throughout that as well. Um, first Robotics is just, you know, grown, grown, grown robotics. We're the number one state in the nation now. Um, and governor's put money in that area. Of course, Dow High led the charge here. Um, <laughs> and they led the hot here and the Midland High grew and then we grew on into our middle schools and our elementary <coughs> carpenter's gonna become a part of it's gonna become a um, uh, first robotics and so I think with all that hubbub of Midland I got invited to be on the, the steering committee because the worlds are coming to Detroit and so I feel a little bit lost to be honest I said on the first couple of meetings that the robotics world's a little beyond the superintendent but they want that that superintendent on that committee so I'm flattered to be on it and I'll represent as the best I can on that one as well um, Neil upgrades, so I just went through um, our follow-up upgrades with our consultant. I always kind of have to wait on him a little bit, so if you wonder why it's fall, but we're getting close to winter. He's been here now for a week of the review. It goes into the system, and our committee meets um, first of December, and then it'll be coming to you for full approval as we go forward. Pretty simple up update this time through um, going forward. Uh, I have one other one if I recall. Dow High. So Dow High has reached out and is requesting to raise funds <clears throat> to improve their stadium complex. And they have multiple phases on this. And so um, I think at least the agenda group met the other day with them. We're pretty comfortable with at least them seeking phase one, you know, going forward. And we'll see where the rest goes. And phase one mainly is like turf and eventually maybe lights, which we definitely could use that turf extra space in the district anyway going forward. I, I little worry a little bit that um, as we know, the community stadium needs lots of work. And I will worry a little bit about this condition of the stands and what that's going to cost. If you remember, that bond work was all signed before the condition of the stands. So I think we've got some tough decisions made there, and we're, we're getting real close to bringing that to you. But even when we're done with the bond work, there probably wasn't enough funds in that community stadium as it's aged out. And so um, I actually found, a, I think Bob maybe gave it to me a while back, where they raised funds in the 80s for that stadium, and maybe time to do that again if we want to make that what we need to be. You know, if that stadium was on a neutral piece of land, the Dow High, Midland High thing would not be an issue. But it is an issue, and we need to recognize it. That we're just not going to get full buy-in in this community. And so I think I kind of support this a little bit at Dow High. I worry about the long range for the district supporting two facilities, and that's probably what drove the decision of one originally. But it's probably time to look at that. But I'm certainly going to leave that up to you guys. But we'll bring that to you guys and you look at that. But that's kind of where I stand, I think, at this point with that piece of it. They have multiple phases. It's big ticket if they actually were going after all of it. But they're asking, I think, more to go after phase one. So that will go to FFO in December and then make the December board meeting for you guys. Just a few kind of gifts given your blessing if you're OK with them going forward, trying to raise funds out there for that. That's all I have. All right, thank you. So. Couple things here before we go into closed session. First, Cindy did a quick tally, and so the um, nominating committee for 2018 will be um, Pam, 
and Patrick and myself. So we will um, meet, but before then, at some point, I'll get with you, Cindy, we will send out to everybody the form where you, you know, fill out and put, um, show what um, your interests are. And it's a lot of times happen with that, you know, a lot of interest in one area and not in another. So um, decisions, you know, are then made. All right, we have that. The um, next thing, we are going to be voting to go into closed session to, um, at Mike's request, to work on his um, evaluation for this year. And so the first thing is for all the students, I know a lot of you, we signed your forms. I don't know if there's anybody else that needs a form signed. Um, after we elect to go into closed session, please come up here and we will sign it um, before you leave. So don't be worried that you'll miss a sign in it because you certainly don't want to stay while we're in closed <laughs> session because <laughs> I'm not sure how long this will go. So the um, next thing we need to do is we do have a limit in how long board meetings can go. I have a feeling we will go past that this evening. And so we need to vote right now to extend the time so that we've taken care of that out of the um, equation. So I do not know how long this is going to take. I would propose maybe a 1030 just to make sure to give us the window that we need. Not that I want to go that long, but I certainly don't want to run into something um, ahead of time. So. I move to uh, adjust the set adjournment time from 9.30 until such time that we complete our meeting, but to go no later than 10.30. All right. Support. All right, thank you. Angela, I think you need to mention that there will be no action taken tonight. Oh, yes. So your only, the only action when we come out of closed session right. is to close the meeting. Yes. That the actual evaluation is acted upon and presented upon in December. Yeah, yes. So in December, we will come back with um, <coughs> everything that was discussed tonight. So yes, when we come back into session, it will just be to come back in open session and adjourn the meeting. So there will be no other business that will take place after that time. Um, Back to this, though, I had moved by Pam, supported by Scott. Is there any discussion? All right, so all those in favor of extending our meeting time till a maximum of 1030, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? All right, thank you. This time, um, motion. To motion, close. yeah. Closed session? Yep. So moved. All right. Motion by Mary to go into closed session. Second. All right. Support by Pam. All those in, or any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? All right, at this time we will move into closed session. Like I said, if anyone needs a sign, please come up here. <coughs> 